Hi, this is Joseph McBride. I'm talking to you from San Francisco, California, USA. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to be part of the chaplain tribute. Um, as you can see, I'm in my work room here, my study, and I've been writing a book on Ernst Lubitsch uh, called How Did Lubitsch Do It? It's coming out in June in the United States from Columbia University Press. And that got me uh, interested again in A Woman of Paris. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're showing that. It's a, a great film, I think. And uh, uh, when I watched it again for my Lubitsch research, because he was uh, tremendously influenced by that film, I was just amazed by what a wonderful, wonderful film Chaplin made. It's uh, <clears throat> a very subtle film, as, as you will see. It's uh, very sophisticated. It was a great departure for Chaplin, who was uh, the world's most popular comedian already by that time, and uh, he had been making films centered around his own character, The Tramp, but for this time, uh, he decided to make a film in which he was not uh, acting in it at all, except he plays a tiny little part. You see uh, at the train station, uh, early in the film, there's a baggage carrier <clears throat> who is Charlie Chaplin carrying a heavy trunk, uh, but you would never know that unless somebody told you because he's not not recognizable, but um, for Chaplin's fans, when you think about this, it's quite remarkable to see a Chaplin film without Chaplin, uh, and that <clears throat> limited the appeal of the film somewhat. It was not, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold here, it was not as huge a hit as his normal films, but it was very highly acclaimed by the critics, and it was extremely influential with his fellow filmmakers. Uh, not only Lubitsch, but many other filmmakers. Michael Powell, the British director who uh, <clears throat> was a young man at the time he saw the film, said it changed his whole view of cinema because it showed grown-up people in sophisticated situations, and it showed him what the cinema was capable of being, and it really changed his whole life. And Lubitsch uh, sometimes is um, said to have changed <clears throat> his style uh, when he saw A Woman of Paris, also a Maurice Stiller film from 1920 called Eroticon. And these films had a big influence on his development, but he had already been making some sophisticated comedies in Germany and developing his oblique elliptical style. So uh, it wasn't so much a matter of just changing overnight as as a more simplistic view would have of it. It was more... <clears throat> moving him along, advancing his, uh, his, his predilections and, and emboldening him, showing him uh, what a, a, an important director could do in terms of allowing the audience's imagination to fill in gaps. That was the thing that seemed to have inspired him the most about A Woman in Paris because uh, um, so much of it is oblique. Uh, it happens off camera. For example, <clears throat> the woman in the film, Edna Proviance, who was Chaplin's uh, mistress for uh, quite a while in the early days, and leading lady in a number of his films, she's very good. Um, when she goes to Paris and becomes, uh, well, not to anticipate the plot too much, but she's going there with her young male friend to escape this provincial town, and uh, a misunderstanding occurs, and... Um, she thinks he's abandoned her, so she winds up in Paris. And then there's a title that talks about her transformation a year later into a sophisticated woman. And she's so you see her entering a nightclub as the very fancy mistress of Adolf Manjou, who's the man about town, who is um, very suave, very um, wry. He always has this smirking grin on his face. He's, uh, Lubitsch used him, after seeing this, he put him in The Marriage Circle, which is a great film, and um, he also put him in Forbidden Paradise, and Imaju made many films in which he plays a kind of rake or playboy. And uh, you're left to infer from this title what happened to her in a year to change her from this nice provincial young woman into this uh, kept woman of this uh, notorious playboy. And um, it, your mind works, and that Lubitsch liked that. He liked the audience to participate. As Billy Wilder said, some directors 
say 2 plus 2 equals 4, and um, others say 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4, etc. But Lubitsch would just say 2 plus 2 and let you add it up. And uh, Lubitsch said, uh, if you do that, the audience will love you for it. And that's what Chaplin did, and that's one of the things that he partly learned from Chaplin, was you could suggest a few things and the audience could fill it in, and it flatters our intelligence, and uh, uh, if you're sophisticated and smart, you, can, you, know, you don't need to have it all spelled out. Also, Adolf Manjou wrote an interesting thing, that um, by 1923, the film industry was already bedeviled by censorship. They had had some scandals in Hollywood that had caused a lot of public criticism of Hollywood as being a out of control, lewd place, you know, a bad influence on the public, etc. So the industry was trying to deal with that by um, <clears throat> starting the early push toward a certain amount of censorship or control of filmmaking, which got out of hand in the 30s with the production code being enforced uh, through the 20s, early 30s, it was only loosely enforced, but it had some effect. And uh, But Mantra made the point that they had to deal with state censorship boards. And uh, <clears throat> each of the American states had its own board, and uh, individual cities <clears throat> had boards of censorship, Chicago, New York, et cetera, and also small, small towns. And so you would have a film that would go out and um, different cities and towns would cut the film different ways according to their own hang-ups and uh, tastes. And uh, so you could have a film that would be uh, okay for New York or Massachusetts or something, but then when it gets to Arkansas or Omaha, it would be um, seriously cut. And so Chaplin worried about that. And <clears throat> Manju said that um, showing the romance developing was, a, you know, kind of a dicey thing to do. So uh, Chaplin hardly avoided that with ellipses. And that is part of what's good about this film. It's not obvious. It's not heavy handed. Um, and it's not, uh, it's a moralistic film in a sense that it shows, like Lubitsch does, how men and women should treat each other. But Chaplin, well, Lubitsch certainly was not a conventional moralist. He was he was unconventional. Chaplin was unconventional in many ways too. He was more of a sentimentalist than Lubitsch. But uh, *A Woman of Paris* is not a sentimental film, which is unusual for Chaplin too. It's a pretty um, cool and, uh, in some ways, hard-edged look at um, uh, some of the seamier sides or darker sides of. Um, of uh, romance and money and uh, the relationship between the two. And, um, uh, but he, he is tolerated and wise of his character, wise about his characters. And uh, he, um, he included a, uh, a title in, in this film when it, when it originally came out. Let me find this because he cut the title when he reissued the film many years later. And it was unfortunate because the title is terrific and it uh, captures the film. Let me just find this for you here. Um, sorry. Ah, all of us are seeking good. We sin only in blindness. The ignorant condemn our mistakes, but the wise pity them. So that's very generous in Chaplin's view of humanity that uh, uh, we should pity or tolerate human weakness instead of condemning it. And certainly that's a lesson Lubitsch learned. He already knew that, but he was uh, extremely tolerant of his characters, and uh, that's a sign of sophistication. There are many, many touches in um, A Woman of Paris that became famous and influential. One, one that you'll notice that's particularly wonderful and that Lubitsch learned from a lot is when uh, Adolf Manju goes into Edna Proviance's apartment, which he's paying for, and he's paying for her, and he's paying the whole thing. And he, he waltzes into the apartment uh, in a very casual way and uh, takes a drink, and then he goes into her uh, bedroom, and he um, goes into her chiffonnier, and he takes out a uh, handkerchief and um, uh, shows his familiarity with uh, 
place and the fact that he can totally control what he's doing there. He has uh, absolute license. And that shows you, in a nutshell, their relationship without, you know, any melodramatic scenes or any uh, ways of spelling it out and without using titles or anything. It's, it's really good filmmaking. So the film is full of little things like that that are just terrific. And uh, so I think Women of Paris holds up extremely well. It's a drama. It's funny, but it's primarily dramatic. And it's um, ironic. Uh, it's nonchalant. Lubitsch referred to nonchalance as what he liked in acting, and that's why he liked it in Elf Maggi, the, the epitome of that. But the direction is nonchalant, too, in a, in a kind of deceptive way, because it's a serious film about serious issues about how men and women treat each other and uh, how women are used and uh, are treated like commodities, etc. And uh, so, but it's done in a kind of offhand light style, which is, uh, you know, very good sophisticated filmmaking because it doesn't hit you over the head with its message. So thank you again for having me and uh, I hope you enjoy this great film and good luck and uh, uh, Hope you enjoy my Lubitsch book when it comes out in uh, June. It's um, a labor of love. I spent nine years over, and Lubitsch was uh, the master of romantic comedy. Uh, he, had, he had learned so much from Chaplin. He thought Chaplin was the world's greatest actor, he said in the 20s. People were kind of shocked to hear that because they thought of him as oh, he's a comedian. But he said, no, no, he's the greatest tragedian. He's the greatest actor in the world. He's, you know. And, um, not, and he was the most successful filmmaker who ever lived in terms of pleasing the audience. This film didn't please them as much as the Tramp films. Uh, but it's for kind of a more refined sensibility, but you'll, you'll see that it was a great advance in his style. So thank you very much for having me, and uh, take care.